no, 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 no. There's no problem here. I was just hoping you might give me some insight into the evolution of the market economy in the southern colonies. My contention is that uh, prior to the Revolutionary War, the economic modalities, especially in the southern colonies, could most aptly be characterized as agrarian pre capital. All right, of course that's your Hang contention. On a second. You're a first year grad student. You just got finished reading some Moxian historian, Pete Garrison, probably. You're going to be convinced of that till next month when you get to James Lemon. Then you're going to be talking about how the economies of Virginia and Pennsylvania were entrepreneurial and capitalist way back in 1740. That's going to last until next year. You're going to be in here regurgitating Gordon Wood talking about, you know, the pre revolutionary utopia and the capital forming effects of military mobilization. As a matter of fact, I won't because Wood drastically underestimates the impact Wood of social distinctions. Wood drastically underestimates the impact of social distinctions predicated upon wealth, especially inherited wealth. You got that from Vickers. Work in Essex County, page 98, right? Yeah, I read that too. Were you going to plagiarize the whole thing for us? Do you have any thoughts of your own on this matter? Or do you, is that your thing? You come into a bar, you read some obscure passage, and then pretend you, you pawn it off as your own... Is your own idea just to impress some girls, embarrass my friend? The intellectual standards applied to thinking, intellectual traits applied to the thinker, the, the quality of a person rather than the quality of a person's thought. Intellectual humility, in fact, all of these traits, you have to have the word intellectual with the, with the concept except in the case of fair-mindedness. Uh, because if you just take humility by itself, it means something very different from intellectual humility. Lots of humble people are not intellectually humble. And uh, some intellectually humble people sound arrogant. So it's intellectual humility must be understood with both of the concepts together. An intellectually humble person is a person who values and seeks out knowledge of their ignorance. And the fact is, one of the most important forms of knowledge is knowledge of ignorance. If you know what is not known, and you know that in detail, you can explore the unknown. But when you think you know something that you don't know, you are neither motivated to find out, nor do you know how to find out. So that uh, the best thinkers that we've had, I think it's arguable, have been students of our ignorance. They've seen clearly how significant various forms of ignorance were, and they have pursued to fill in that ignorance with knowledge and have not been satisfied with a superficial answer. So consciousness of the limits of one no one's knowledge, including a sensitivity to circumstances in which one's native egocentricity is likely to function self-deceptively. Aristotle defined humans as the rational animal. I would say that humans are the self-deceiving animal. That the most obvious characteristic of us is that we refuse to see ourselves as we are and create images of ourselves that stroke our ego, make, our, make, our, make us feel better about ourselves. And sometimes the more horrendous our behavior, the better <coughs> our image is to cover up that behavior. Uh, one could take very obvious cases like the self-image of Germans during Nazi Germany and the ease with which they felt very proud of what they were doing, even though what they were doing was horrible stuff. The capacity of the human mind to deceive itself seems unlimited. What is the message there? The message is that there are known knowns. There are things we know that we know. There are known unknowns. That is to say, there are things that we now know we don't know. But there are also unknown unknowns. There are things we do not know we don't know. So when we do the best we can, and we pull all this information together, and, and we then say, well, that's basically what we see as the situation. That is really only the known knowns and the known unknowns. 
On the other hand, I do think that scientists tend to know the philosophy of science of 50 years ago. And perhaps this is the bad thing, that it's perhaps this time lag, this culture lag, has some value in weeding out what they shouldn't pay attention to. I mean, it's annoying to a philosopher to encounter a scientist who's both sure that he needn't listen to any philosophy of science, and then who produces verbatim ideas which you can recognize as coming from what was popular in 1928. And is there a direct parallel here between what you're saying about scientists and Kane, the, the economist Keynes's famous remark that nearly all businessmen who thought that they were indifferent to airy-fairy economic theory were in fact the slaves of the economic theorists of yesterday, of a previous generation? That's exactly true. And what I'm going to do, I'm telling you right now, because you will be surprised in the, in the course of that uh, class, I will first present these answers as persuasively as possible. So what I want to do is, when I talk about in this position inductivism, what I want to achieve is that once I finish my presentation of that position, that you say, wow, now I know what science is. Right? That's the right answer. And then you say, wow, yes, I'm an inductivist. Boo, I tell my mother, write out, I write her an email, right? <laughs> I'm an inductivist now, ma'am. It's wonderful, I know what science is, right? That is what I try to do. And then I will try to criticize, right, that position, that inductivist position, and show you that where you first be completely convinced, then you see, wow, there are critical remarks. Oh, damn it. Oh, that's difficult. Oh, it doesn't really work. Right? And then you are very disappointed. Right? And again, write again to your mother or your sister and say, I'm very disappointed, mom, inductivism doesn't work. Okay? And then I'll do the same again. Then I present you deductivism because deductivism will be an answer to the problems of inductivism. Right? Deductivism is a different position. Again, you don't know what that means. It's a different position that was developed because of the problems of inductivism. And deductivism said, I can heal you know, all these problems here. I, can, you know, I have a good medicine against it. And I tell you really what science is. Right? And I'm going to tell you what, it, what the answer of deductivism is, such that at the end of the presentation of deductivism says, my God, I'm so happy that I'm not an inductivist anymore because now I'm a, a deductivist. And now I know the truth about science. Right? Um, yes, but then I'll start the same game again, and I'll show you what the problems of deductivism are. And then you get counter-arguments against deductivism. And that I do four times, right? So the training you're getting is that you start thinking, and I'm trying to really seduce you into inductivism. I'm going to seduce you into deductivism.